My name is Daniela Andrade. I'm MD, PhD at University of Sao Paulo, and I want to thank all organizers for inviting me to be in this um, conference. Good morning. I'm Rosalind Ramsey Goldman, and um, I'm an MD, DRPH, uh, and I'm at Northwestern University in Chicago, and it's an honor and a pleasure to um, co-chair this with Dr. Andrade and to um, introduce um, our speaker. Uh, the topic is infections in SLE, and this lecture will be given by Dr. Yehuda Schoenfeld, who is the head of the, who is the, head of the Zolitowicz Center for Autoimmune Diseases at the Sheba Medical Center, which is affiliated with the Sackler Faculty of Medicine in Tel Aviv University in Israel. He's the incumbent of the Laura Schwartz Pip Chair for Research of Autoimmune Diseases in the Tel Aviv University. He's published over 1,700 peer-reviewed papers and 25 textbooks. His clinical and scientific works focus on autoimmune and rheumatic diseases, and he is the founder and editor of Autoimmunity Reviews. Please welcome me, help and join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Feld in um, presenting his lecture this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman, I have to say. Uh, for this kind of honor. I know that um, I was introduced as a replacement to my dear friend uh, Sandra Navarra, who uh, was not able to be granted um, a visa to hear. And therefore, I have to replace her talk, which she was supposed to talk about infections in SLE, which are most probably the complications of uh, immunosuppression as well as corticosteroids and most probably some of the um, biologics. But I'm going to talk about infections and uh, SLE in which I would pay more attention on prevention, how we can prevent in the future SLE from those who are genetically prone to develop autoimmune disease. And therefore I would like to draw your attention to the book that we have published about infections and autoimmunity. And uh, I can say that by and large, infections are the most important environmental factors inducing autoimmune condition in genetically determined people. And to a book in which you can see was translated to um, uh, a Chinese, just in case that you do not understand the English, um, and in which we refer to the 180 different autoantibodies characterizing uh, different autoimmune diseases. And I would like to say at the beginning, even though this is not the aim of my talk, that it's not genetics which determine autoimmune disease, it's genetic which determine the autoantibody that you, the individual, will develop when you will meet an environmental factor, especially infectious agent, and then the autoantibody will determine the clinical manifestations, and I will show you some clini clinical data. And last but not least, without advertisement, we cannot continue to uh, uh, have the show, and this is the advertisement to our next International Congress of Autoimmunity, which will be in Nice in March, 2014, what I can guarantee you is the weather. It will be a sunny day. Be it as it may, those who would like to leave the talk right now, I draw your attention to a review that we have written about infection and autoimmune diseases in trends of immunology, even though many of the details that I will give here today are completely new and were published only in the last several weeks or several months and therefore maybe you should deter from leaving the room. Be it as it may, I would like to start with the fact that autoimmune diseases are multifactorial, and therefore genetic as well as immune defects are playing in concert to make somebody prone to develop the autoimmune disease. And it's just enough that I will mention that all those individuals in the world who had C1Q deficiency so far already developed systemic lupus uh, erythematosus. Um, an additional player in the concert 
are the hormones, and I would, like, would, not, would not like to talk only about estrogen, which, by the way, may play uh, a role in enhancing B lymphocyte stimulating factor. So this might be an additional explanation why women are a priori more prone to develop autoimmune disease. And last but not least are the infecting agents and the environmental factors, which are not only the trigger mechanism which will determine that you will develop the disease in 4th of July or 12th of September, but as you will see in my talk, the infecting agent actually are determining what will be the clinical manifestation that you will develop during uh, your life. So as you can see, we have many environmental factors from drugs that we are responsible, and I mentioned the biologics, to toxin and as well as smoking, which uh, drew attention during the last um, decade. Just to show two recent very important examples, and this is the relationship between just staphylococci, which are in our nose mucosa, which are associated with vaginal uh, granulomatosis, and another recent paper which determines what I uh, uh, actually envisioned many, many years back, and I couldn't do the study, that mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis may be instrumental in autoimmune diseases and most probably other mycobacteria because of their adjuvant capacity. And those who are working in the lab and use complete foreign adjuvant, the complete foreign adjuvant which enables us to and uh, induce experimental models in mice, rabbits, and rats are actually, uh, the uh, uh, complete fondagion is actually constituted of mycobacterial uh, constituent. This is my dog, Billy, who is helping me quite often to do the PubMed research. And in the future, we will use dogs more for that because it's a simple uh, work to do. You can see his satisfaction with his tongue when he found more than almost 30,000 papers relating to the relationship between infection and autoimmunity. I would like to start with something that misled the literature for more than 50 or 60 years, and this is the rheumatic fever, which misled us because exactly three weeks after the infection with the streptococcus, um, either in the throat or in the skin, uh, the patient developed antibodies against the M protein on the streptococcus, which cross-reacted molecular mimicry with the M protein in the astral glia, in the synovial cells, as well as on the endothelium of the heart. And therefore, we had the chorea movements, the uh, deformities of the valves, and the arthritis misleading because we thought, first of all, that it's only rheumatic fever, misleading because we thought it has to be three weeks exactly after the infection, and today we know that it may take years after the infections, and not only that, it's not only one infection, it may be the burden of infection which will uh, the person accumulate during his life and induce many different autoantibodies to get eventually the disease that uh, he develops. Um, and um, as you can see, the last misleading um, uh, assumption was that all autoimmune diseases after infections are induced by molecular mimicry. And as we will see, the mosaic of autoimmunity is expanded in such a way that today we have most probably more than 30 or 40 different mechanisms by which the infecting agent can cause the disease. So rheumatic fever was indeed the um, tip of the iceberg. Indeed, it was molecular mimicry in this case. But today we know that every disease which has the name autoimmune uh, actually is caused by infecting agents. Uh, and we know that there are also other and additional factors like SLE, antiphospholipidinum, and rheumatoid arthritis. There are some infecting agents which are notorious, like the EB virus, and I mentioned in my introductory talk at the opening ceremony that currently we know for sure that 33 different autoimmune diseases, specifically SLE, 
and multiple sclerosis and APS and rheumatoid arthritis, which might be induced by uh, EB virus. And there are other infecting agents, bacteria or viruses, which are so far known to be associated with one disease or two uh, diseases. As I mentioned before, one of the misleading assumptions because of rheumatic fever was the mechanism, and it was believed that it was only molecular mimicry. Uh, as you can see here, the copy-paste of the children, the twins, as you can see, this is the molecular mimicry. But today we know that there are many different and diverse mechanisms which enable actually the immune system not to recognize what is self. And I will not dwell into all the mechanisms, even though I will mention a few of them when I will list different um, infecting agents. During the last years, it has been found that uh, the infecting agent among many mechanisms are involving uh, by stimulating or enhancing the toll-like receptor, the innate immunity, and it's not surprising that many of the receptors of the toll-like uh, family are actually stimulated by bacteria, viruses, or DNA, or RNA of bacteria and viruses. And therefore, it's not surprising that if you have a polymorphism in uh, this toll-like receptor, you, may, you are more prone to develop one disease or another. Toll-like receptor 4 with, um, uh, for instance, APS, toll-like receptor 7 and 9 with SLE. So we can see immediately the relationship between the infecting agent the genetic background, which is another pebble in the mosaic of autoimmunity. If we will take just hepatitis C, another notorious uh, virus, we can see that we may have six, eight, or nine classical autoimmune diseases. The most uh, prominent is mixed cryoglobulinemia, in which today we direct the therapy against the virus, rather against the disease manifestations or mechanism. This will come again in my talk, in which we will discuss whether we should treat some patients with autoimmune diseases with antibiotics, antiviral uh, drugs, or maybe specific uh, vaccines. When together with my friend Elias Stubi, we have analyzed what happens to carriers of hepatitis C that are more prone to develop these nine different autoimmune diseases, we have found that these patients have very high levels of the bliss, the B lymphocyte stimulating substance, uh, so much so that the levels are very similar to SLE patients. This raises the possibility that if we are talking about prevention of autoimmune diseases by infecting agents, maybe in the future, maybe in five years, maybe in 10 years, there will be a decision to treat these carriers of hepatitis C with the new drug, Benlista, uh, to avoid the eventual development of autoimmune uh, diseases. So as you can see, many infecting agents can cause many autoimmune diseases, and the mechanisms are diverse. Now I would like to draw your attention to the play, to the interplay between the infecting agent and the genetic uh, background. And I would like just to talk and to dwell into EB virus, which is so important in many autoimmune diseases. Let's take a patient with HLA-DR15 that is very romantic, as you can see here in the picture, Italian picture, and kiss his mate and encounter EB virus from her or she from him, and unfortunately she will develop or he will develop a deleterious disease, multiple sclerosis. But the same EB virus in a more modern kiss, as you can see here, uh, in a subject who has HLA-DR3, one of the most common HLA in the population, he or she will develop thyroiditis, which is, so to speak, a benign condition. Also to explain why the thyroiditis or the HLA-DR3, and specifically if it is associated with A1 and B8 um, uh, haplotypes, may be the most prevalent indicator that in this family we have a tendency to develop an autoimmune disease. Maybe in the future when we'll have more tools, and we do have already many of them, we will be able to recommend this subject 
uh, a vaccine against, hepata against EB virus because we will be able to avoid many, many cases of um, uh, autoimmune diseases induced by EB virus, as you can see here. How EB virus is so instrumental in inducing so many diseases? We have seen the HCV, with actually its induction of bliss. The EB virus actually caused differentiation of the CD25B cells and the long-lasting plasma cells, which we know are so important in prolongation and exacerbation of SLE diseases. This does not mean to say that they just play in a vacuum because additional environmental factors may interact with the viral and genetic. And here you can see a study which combined the smoking that we know that it's so important in rheumatoid arthritis as well as in SLE with the specific HLA, HLA, DRB1 and uh, the EB virus. So as we can see, the smoking actually enhanced the effect of the combination of the EB virus with the uh, genetic uh, background that is specific here. However, since I'm coming from the Holy Land and I have very special relationship with God, I always give some credit to God that he didn't send us only diseases but also protect us. And indeed, among the HLA that he gave us that we inherit from our father and mother, there are some protective HLA, just to indicate why in the same family one member may have a SLE, the other may have Crohn's disease, but the third one is completely protected. So if we will take the cryoglobulinemia and the hepatitis C virus, as you can see, if you have DR11, and especially if you are living in South Italy, there is great chance that you will develop mixed cryoglobulinemia. But if your parents wander to the north, to the Scandinavian countries, and you carry the HLA DR7, you are protected from developing actually uh, cryoglobulinum. So as you can see, the infection and genetic are intimately interacting. There are pathogenic infection. There are pathogenic uh, HLA genetics. But as you will see, we have protective genetic, and we will have also protective infecting agent. Just dwelling into the issue of EB virus, when we have analyzed the presence, the past encounter with EB virus by 4,000 subjects whose Sarah was in our laboratory for the presence of anti-EB virus, you can see that here we have the normal, which are quite high. They have quite high exposure to EB virus, but you can see that many autoimmune diseases have very high levels. But we found that also polymyositis and specifically SLE plus APS have high exposure to EB virus. This just indicates another disease which is associated or may be induced by EB virus, but also may explain why some patients may have SLE. Another patient may have SLE and APS. It depends on the different uh, infecting agent that the subject was exposed during his life. This is supported not only by previous exposure, if you measure actually the actual, actual viral load in the blood, you can see that patients with SLE have a 15-fold higher uh, concentration of the viral load. But we ask the question, um, with what the presence of, or the previous presence of EB virus is associated with SLE? And we started with the clinical manifestations. And here we had a big surprise, namely that we found that EB virus causes SLE, but you are lucky, it will be what we call mild SLE. What is mild SLE? SLE that may re respond to Benlista. And you will see that there was a great association between previous exposure to EBV virus and cutaneous manifestation, as you can see here, as well as with joint manifestation. And this was published by Giselle and Nancy uh, from our group. So this was like the first indication that the virus caused SLE, but it also determined what will be the clinical presentation of uh, the patients. So how to explain this um, uh, uh, interaction? 
How the virus can determine if I will have skin manifestation or joint manifestation or, God forbid, nephritis. So we try to correlate the presence of the EB virus um, exposure to the different serological marker. And here came the big surprise. The EB virus was associated with anti-Rho and anti-La, not with anti-double-standard DNA. And when you think that you find something for the first time, go to the literature and find if somebody in Japan didn't publish it before. And indeed, there were many publications indicating the close correlation between anti-Rho, anti-La, and serological manifestation, as you know also from the congenital um, SLE that we know. So infection can determine, actually, the clinical manifestation, and my dear friend, um, Rika Cervera has several pub publications about SLE, Siegren, and uh, a, a rheumatoid arthritis in which the presence of HCV actually determines the clinical manifestation. So we are not the only one who relate the infection to the uh, symptomatic exposure of the patient. I would like now to move to another very interesting revelation that we had, and it is associated with something that most of us are not dealing with, and this is a yeast called Saccharomyces cervicea. I have to acknowledge here Maurizio Rinaldi and Carlo Pericono, who came to our laboratory from Italy, and actually enlightened this issue. As you know, the yeast is extremely prevalent because we, we use it for preparing bread as well as for drinking uh, or preparing the beer. Now, that raises the big question whether um, those who eat uh, bread or those who are heavy drinkers have more autoimmune diseases. This we will analyze in the future. But we were exposed to Saccharomyces cervice because all of us knew that patients with Crohn disease, 40% of them, develop antibodies against Saccharomyces uh, cervice, and we are even using it as a diagnostic measurement. Actually, in a study that we done in the journal GUT many years back on Israeli army recruits who developed eventually Crohn's disease, we found that they had the anti saccharomyces cervicea years before they were recruited to the army, just to indicate that they were already prone to develop the disease, and it's not the service in the army, the stress, maybe other things, which induced uh, the disease. So what is so important with Saccharomyces cervicea and different autoimmune diseases? What Maurizio and Carlo found is that in most of the vaccines in the world, the companies are using the Saccharomyces cervicea to prepare the vaccine. In some cases, it's another part of the Saccharomyces cervicea. In another, it's another part of it. And actually, the Saccharomyces cervicea is acting as an adjuvant. They cannot clean the Saccharomyces cervicea from the vaccine. So when we are exposed as children to 25 different vaccines, we are exposed also to the Saccharomyces cervicea. And this brings me to the Asia syndrome that I talked yesterday, the autoimmune um, uh, syndromes which are induced by adjuvant. It includes the vaccine-induced autoimmune diseases as well as the silicon, which is a separate issue. So what was surprising to us that when we analyzed and other people analyzed rheumatoid arthritis patients, 40% of rheumatoid arthritis patients have autoantibodies to saccharomyces. And what about SLE? Here it was big surprise. Close to 60% of patients with SLE have actually or harbor antibodies to Saccharomyces cervicea. And this raises the question, what is the contribution of Saccharomyces? And I remind you, Saccharomyces with EB virus or with another infection later on. So it's not surprising when we looked in the literature, we found already the molecular mimicry between beta-glucans, which is a constituent of the saccharomyces and induction of um, autoantibodies to 
la, if you remember the la that we have spoken before, as well as there was molecular mimicry between the Saccharomyces constituent and the Smith antigen. We do have only 10% patient with SLE which have anti-SM antibodies and it is regarded as highly, highly specific for the disease. So it's not surprising when this constituent of the Saccharomyces were injected into NZBW mice who are prone to develop um, SLE, you can see how it accelerated actually the development of anti-double-stranded DNA. The EB virus was associated with anti and anti rho and the Saccharomyces with anti-double-stranded DNA, and it can show how it accelerated the disease to shorten the lifespan of NZBW, the SLE mice, with injection of this beta-glucan, the constituent of Saccharomyces. So in summary, you can see here a large table which appeared about two weeks ago in the literature to show you that each one of the autoimmune diseases, including antiphospholipid syndrome, is associated with high titer of anti-Saccharomyces antibodies. We still did not harness this information for diagnostic uh, purposes. And this raises the question whether indeed these uh, yeast are part of the environment that we are living, that in the future we might somehow avoid it to prevent autoimmune diseases. The last, the last question is whether we should, or the two last questions, whether we should add antibiotics to our armamentarium. And I would like to follow with Helicobacter pylori. When we have analyzed our 4,000 serial 4, patients with, S, with autoimmune disease, we find that Dr. some Shoffer, of the diseases five you have left. previous... Sorry? Five minutes left. Yes. Uh, we, have, we find very high uh, prevalence in uh, vasculitis patients, but in IBD uh, infection, we find actually uh, a low level, indicating that actually the H. pylori may be actually a cause of um, different autoimmune diseases and some other it may prevent it. This is a study in idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, idiopathic that we are idiots that we don't know the pathology, in which antibiotics was given to children with positive helicobacter pylori and you can see the positive and increased number of the platelets. So last but not least, I would like to talk with the hygiene theory that we can harness toward our better therapy of autoimmunity in the future. We do know whether there is malaria, there is no SLE, where there are helminths, we don't have autoimmune diseases. Actually, it was harnessed into experimental models in which in each one of the experimental models giving the helminths or the egg of the helminths prevented the autoimmune disease. This raised the possibility that we will treat inflammatory bowel disease with maybe helminths or eggs. This was already done. It's in practice. The FDA approved it recently, and patients with Crohn's disease are treated with eggs of helminths, but not irregular eggs, eggs of pork or pig helminths in which the final host is a pork and therefore the helminths or the eggs do not hatch and do not go from your lower parts of the body. These are the eggs. There were no side effects to this therapy, so it's like a natural uh, therapy. And the question that was asked, what is the mechanism? The mechanism is actually switching from a, a TH1 to TH2 and uh, inducing T regulatory cells. So the question is not to return, as you can see, to this system of life in the past or to eat uh, helminths like we may eat in the um, McDonald's, but to use and to know what is the chemical compound in the eggs or in the helminths which does it. And this is the phosphorylcholine in which we have attached it to additional molecule to make it immunogenic. And we went to our little collaborators who do not complain and still do not have to feel the informed consent. And we treated them with this phosphorylcholine and tafzin compound. And you can see how we were able to prolong their life, the NZBW, as actually um, uh, lower the levels of um, anti-double-stranded DNA. 
So in summary, how do we develop autoimmune diseases? How do we develop SLE? Why somebody develop APS and not SLE? It will be determined by the infectious burden that you are exposed to in your life together with the proper genetic. It may be protective, it may be pathogenic, and it will involve the different um, uh, infectious agent that you accumulate during your life to see if your disease will stay as SLE or will be diverted to APS or you will develop SLE in the future. So when I traveled in Washington in front of the National Acad Academy of Sciences, I saw this huge statue of Einstein in which something was written on the book on his knees. And when I came closer, I have realized that what was written, everything is infectious until proven otherwise, including this red one and white one. Thank you very much for your attention.